Thanks very much for inviting me to give this lecture. My lecture is going to be entitled Statistical Inference for Time Frequency Analysis. I'm Emory Brown. I'm at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and I'm also on the faculty at MIT in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, as well as in the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science. These are the sources of funding that I've had the good fortune to have to support this research. The Department of Anesthesia at Mass General Hospital, several institutes at, at MIT, as well as NIH funding. And I'll just point out that I do have a, an interest in the startup company Pascal, and Massimo has licensed some of the IP that's based on the algorithms that I'll talk about here today. So this is the over this is an overview of the outline that I'm going to follow. I'm going to take a, a quick look at signal processing and general anesthesia to motivate why these problems may be of interest. I'm going to speak specifically about multi-taper time frequency methods for computing spectra and spectrograms. And then what I want to develop is a state-space multi-taper time frequency analysis that has two very compelling features um, relative to multi-taper time frequency analysis. And they are enhanced spectral resolution and denoising and the ability to conduct formal statistical inferences for any feature of the spectrogram that uh, you're interested in. So let me start by giving a definition of general anesthesia. What is general anesthesia? It's a drug-induced reversible state comprised of unconsciousness, amnesia, antinociception, akinesia, in which we maintain stability and control of the physiological systems. So by unconscious, you're not aware of what's, unconscious, you're not aware of what's going on. Amnesia, there's no memory of what's happening. <coughs> Antinociception means there's no perception of or processing of nociceptive or harmful information. Akinesia, you're not moving. And it's key that it be reversible because you put the person in the state and you bring them out of it once the surgery is done. One of the things I'm going to show you is that the, or you're, I'm going to make plausible for you, is that one of the ways that the anesthetics work is by creating very powerful oscillations that disrupt the ability of different parts of the brain to communicate. Ergo, the reason that we want to have very reliable spectral methods to help us characterize these oscillations. So just to illustrate this, this is starting off with someone who's awake. And as you gradually increase the dose of propofol, which is one of our most used anesthetics, you'll see them go into a state of sedation, in which they have oscillations, which are in about the 12 to 16 hertz range. As the doses increase further, you'll see them go into very, very large low frequency oscillations, as maybe as, as low as less than one hertz or one to four, or 0 0.1 to four hertz. And then you may see them go from there into a state of burst suppression, where you have an active EEG, then a period of quiescence, followed by a period of activity. And then a state of isoelectricity, meaning the EEG is flat during the, during the burst periods. And then the state that we try to achieve to maintain anesthesia or unconsciousness with propofol is this state here, which is a combination of high frequency oscillations at about 10 hertz and a low frequency oscillation at a little less than one, one hertz. And the key thing to realize about this is as you give increasing doses of the drug, of propofol, you get larger and larger amp amplitude oscillations. So at rest, these oscillations may be about five to five, five um, microvolts, and they reach 20 to 50 microvolts in adults, and maybe as large as 1,000 microvolts in, in kids. And <clears throat> the dynamics change very, very regularly with drugs, drug doses I'm showing you here. There's a, another state of paradox excitation, which we, we won't really comment on for the moment. The key idea is that increasing doses of the drug produces, pr increasing doses produce very strong oscillations. And it's these oscillations that I'm talking about that impair the ability of parts of the brain to communicate. So let me show you this another way. The oscillations also change very regularly with anesthetic. So anesthetics in, in, within the same class will have very similar oscillatory properties. 
And maybe you can infer that from looking at these time domain plots, but what we've discovered is that it's much easier to see if you look at these oscillations in the frequency domain. So here's the spectrograms corresponding to these oscillations that I'm showing you here. So this is classic propofol here, which has a 10 hertz oscillation and a low, low frequency about 0.1 to 1, the 4 hertz oscillation here. Whereas you see sevoflurane, which has power going almost continuously from zero up to 10 hertz. The interesting thing about this is that the propofol and sevoflurane have roughly the same mechanism of action. This is a IV anesthetic and this is a gas anesthetic. But if you look right here in the middle, there's a third oscillation between four to eight hertz, a theta oscillation, which propofol doesn't have. And so here's another illustration of that. Here's sevoflurane with me increasing and sort of slowly de and decreasing the dose of the sevoflurane throughout the course of a surgical case. And you can see here where the sevoflurane dose goes down, the 4 hertz oscillation disappears, you increase it again, it comes back, you decrease it, it, it disappears and so forth. And if you look down here at the bottom, when you have a sufficiently high enough dose of sevoflurane, the four hertz, the four to eight hertz oscillation, theta oscillation is there continuously. And so sevoflurane has a, a pattern which goes from about one hertz up to 10 hertz in adults. And the question is, is this four to eight hertz oscillation, is theta oscillation really there? That's one of the things which we want to explore. And as a second illustration of why we might want to have more reliable spectral or, or more spectral methods that have properties that we can take advantage of or we can control from a statistical inference standpoint is that <clears throat> a very natural question to ask is at different states of being of arousal, awake, loss of consciousness, being unconscious, recovery of consciousness, when you see different changes in the spectra, <clears throat> are they indeed really different? So if you look here, you see this person is awake, okay? And this is, and they're getting increasing doses of propofol. So this is us increasing the infusion rate of propofol and then slowly decreasing it. And the person was awake here, lost consciousness here. They're profoundly unconscious from here to here. They recover consciousness here and they're awake again back over here. And here's the spectrogram corresponding to the same time period, which is about, little over two hours um, from start to finish the experiment. And a very natural question might be if you compare the spectrogram here across all the, all across all the frequencies to let's say the spectrogram here across all the frequencies, are they different? Very natural question to ask. And when you look at the spectrogram here, you see they look quite different, but how do you actually carry this out in a formal statistical sense where you, let's say, take the difference between powers in the spectra, the, the, the powers of different frequencies and actually compute a confidence interval for that. So that's what we want to do. So we want to have an inference for a non-trivial function of the spectrogram. So these are my postdocs and students who have done this work. Um, so Xiong Yun Kim, who was a postdoc in my laboratory, who's now back at uh, King Poly um, National University in Korea. Demba Ba, who's my PhD student and postdoc, who's now an associate professor at um, Harvard in bioengineering, and Michael Beer, who's gone into private industry. So let me let's build up a model, uh, some demonstration, so we can discuss a model framework for this particular problem. So let's assume we have a time series, which is a which is consists of uh, a second order locally stationary. Gaussian process and white noise, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that the locally stationary process is a process that's stationary on, on finite intervals. So we're gonna make the assumption that there are intervals of width J and there are K such intervals and every, on every J, on every interval of width J, you have a stationary process or a second order locally stationary process. So as you move from interval to interval, the process becomes non-stationary. So we want to use this as a way to 
model a non-stationary process by saying what it is, it's a collection of locally stationary processes. <clears throat> so if we now use the, um, we can write this in matrix form or vector form on one of the intervals. So if we take the kth interval, we have a vector of observations, y, k, epsilon, uh, big X, k, epsilon, k. And if we use the spectral representation here, to represent the stationary process on an interval, we can write this as a product of a matrix times these orthogonal in increments. And we can think of this representation here as the spectral representation, or we can think of it as just, you know, writing XK in terms of its inverse Fourier transform, right? So this is gonna be a key part for our model formulation or algorithm formulation. So now, if we take our data on that interval, on that interval k, and we transform it into the into the frequency domain, so it's just taking the data series and essentially rotating it, we now get a new data series, which is the Fourier transform of the data. We have delta zk by itself, and we have this new error term, which is epsilon k superscript f, which is complex normal and independent. <coughs> And the reason we, we the WK, the W disappears is because F times W turns out to be the identity since we took the Fourier transform and W is basically the inverse Fourier transform matrix. So now if in addition, before we, before we um, Fourier transform the data, we apply a taper here. Then if we take F times the taper times YK, this yk superscript m to indicate the taper turns out to have the same distribution as f superscript k y sub k. And remember, one of the reasons that we want to taper the data is because we have a finite data on a finite interval and we want to reduce, reduce the end effects. And so now what we know is it's important to not just take a single taper, but take multi tapers, multiple tapers. And that's the whole idea behind multi taper spectral analysis. So that's why little m here will go from will go from one up to some number big M. So we do this for each of the, each of the tapered series. And if we do that, then we can write a model, a state-space model across all the intervals. So here's the observation model for taper M. It's of the Fourier transform data. Here is the delta ZK corresponding to that M. And we have this error here, which is approximately which is Gaussian. And then we assume, so here's our, our another assumption that the ZKs, the increments are linked by a Gaussian random walk across the interval. So the, the ZK in the previous, on the previous interval, time interval was equal to, on the, excuse me, the ZK on the current intervals, the, the ZK on the previous interval plus some noise. And again, this noise is, We've assumed it to be complex. We, we've assumed it to be complex Gaussian. And so these are the components of our model. So right away with a formulation like this, if you use the variances, then the solution to this is just simply a, a Coleman filter. So it would look something like this. Now this Coleman filter has a very specific feature because when we rotated the data here into the frequency domain, by doing the Fourier transform, these ZKs now are isolated by themselves. So each ZK for each co component of ZK, so ZK has big, <coughs> excuse me, each component of, Z, of delta Z sub K has J, capital J components, and each of those components is independent. So when you apply this for it, when you run a common filter algorithm on the ZKs, you can do it at each interval, excuse me, at each frequency. So little j going from j up to j equal one up to capital J over the Fourier frequencies, let's say. And because you're doing it for a number of tapers, let's say four tapers. So you'd have four times j one dimensional column filters. So this problem separates very nicely from a computational standpoint. And then what you end up doing is you calculate your ZKs at a given frequency for each taper, 
And then for that frequency, you add, you average over the squared modulus of the ZKs and you divide by M. And so that's the averaging. And that gives you your state space multi vapor spectrogram. So this is what we want to use instead of just the standard multi taper spectrum, multi taper spectrogram estimate to compute the spectrum of our data. Now, so this is what it would look like. So we're going to have the state space multi taper, which, as I said, is an average over these ZKs that are updated via a common filter. Each one is updated in, independently because these increments here are independent in, in the frequency domain. Now, <clears throat> if we do no, if we have no state space model, we're just back with our standard multi taper spectrogram. And that's going to be computed by just taking the squared modulus of the tapered then Fourier transform data. Now, if we did no tapering, but we applied the state space model, we'd have a state space periodogram here. Right? And if we did no tapering and we didn't have a state space model at all, we just have a standard periodogram. And what we're going to be assuming is we're going to take the, uh, the periodograms and the, and the multi taper spectrograms on non-overlapping intervals. Another way to do this would be to let the intervals overlap to some degree to increase to, to increase the appearance of smoothness or continuity in the estimates. But we're going to take these on non-overlapping intervals. So they correspond to the non-overlapping intervals of the state space multi taper spectrum. And by the same token, since you have common filter algorithms that run forward, you have the corresponding smoothing algorithms and these are going to be important because they're going to allow us to do computations and calculate the full posterior density of the increments. And then because we have the full posterior density of the inf increments, which is going to be multivariate, complex multivariate Gaussian, we can compute any function at an interval and as a of those increments as a, con as a consequence, any we can compute any confidence intervals, any uncertainty in any, any, any function of those in, intervals or increments that we're interested in. So let's look at a simulated example. <clears throat> so here's, a, here's a, a simulation of a six order AR process. And it's totally, it's totally non-stationary. There's no interval over which it's, it's stationary. So we're gonna have to make an assumption in applying our analysis because we're gonna be using techniques which lay outside the model class which generate the data which is going to be good. So this model, the techniques that we're using aren't quite right because you can see here that this process 16t times t over, oh, 16t small t over big T times vt basically creates a non-stationary process at every time t. And this gives you little snapshots of what this looks like as you move from the left of the, the process from the left all the way over to the right. So for our local in multi taper and our state space multi taper, we're going to take j equals 1024 points, which is going to correspond to 16 seconds. K, the number of intervals, is going to be 125. We're going to pick the number of tapers to be. We're going to pick the number of tapers to be four, and we're going to have the the frequency, <coughs> the spectral resolution is going to be about a half hertz. So, so here is what the data look like. So these are the data again, or snippets of the data, because I can't show you the whole time series. So the, the data, here's the data at 304, here's the data at 960, uh, in between 300 and 310, 960 and 970, and here's the data between 1500 and <coughs> uh, between 1500 here and 1510. Now, so here's the true spectrogram. This is what it looks like, which is easy to compute from the formula for the spectrogram of the AR6 process. And now let's look at our different analyses. So there's a periodogram. So it's tracing out something that looks like the true spectrogram, but one of the things you notice right away is that the background level is far higher than the background level 
in the true spectrogram. In fact, it's higher by almost approximately like 10 decibels. The same is true for multi-taper, even though multi-taper seems to be a little bit better job, doing a better job at identifying the peaks in the spectrum. So you can see this process has peaks in the spectrum at about 3.5 hertz, at about 9 hertz, and 11 hertz. And know that the power in that those peaks is actually increasing with time. When you look at the state space periodogram, it does better than either the periodogram or the multi taper in terms of decreasing the background noise, denoising the, the system, but it doesn't seem to be doing as well as, let's say, maybe the multi taper at identifying the, you know, the three peaks and sort of their evolution with time. And when you put these together, the state space, <clears throat> the state space spectrogram actually does both. It reduces the background noise substantially, and it has a very clear delineation of the peaks in the spectrogram that you can see there. So why does this occur? So look, one thing is when you average over the different tapered estimates, you get a reduction in variance. And so this is a well-known property of multi-taper multi -taper spectrograms. But there's another feature here that explains the denoising for the state space, um, the state space multi-taper spectrogram. And that is when you compute your delta ZK here, which is what this is here, you have, you're basically doing it using a Kalman filter. So this is the Kalman gain. This is the previous delta ZK. And here's, the Kalman gain applied to the new observation, which is the Fourier transform of the data for that particular taper at frequency omega j. And remember, we can do these at individual frequencies because in the frequency domain, the delta zk's are independent. So what you're interested in is computing the squared amplitude here. So we basically, we basically have to consider two cases. So when alpha is close to one, we're using basically the data directly, which means we're just effectively computing the multi-taper uh, spectrogram without any smoothing. However, to the extent that alpha is closer to zero, then we're not using much of the new information coming in from the new observation, which would make this essentially the, the spectrogram for the multi-taper spectrogram. And what we're getting here is just the smooth estimate based on the previous some fraction of the previous uh, the previous delta z so the state space approach does two things it does the averaging or at first what it does is it takes advantage of continuity and it relates the increment the previous increment estimate to the current increment estimate and then once it does that, it then averages, which explains why you see this greater reduction in, in, uh, in noise and also this enhanced resolution. And I'll just point out that the, this is the common gain. The common gain does lie between, between zero and one. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this for an example. So here's the, here's the, the simulated example here at computed at about, um, at, at about 25 minutes. So this is the common gain, which you're seeing in red, and you're seeing the state variance. And so here the two peaks is about 3.5 hertz, and here you are at about 9 and 11 hertz. And so the common gain tends to be large when the power in the spectrum is high, okay? meaning that what you're doing is you're using most of the information coming from the new data the new observation. However, when the power is low, you're tending to smooth. And the same thing here, the same thing here. In other words, the common gain for this particular problem tracks very reliably the, the magnitude of the state space variance. And this is the same thing here that I'm showing you for the example we're about to do with the sequel plotting. So, so there are two reasons that the you see this enhanced denoising and enhanced resolution. It's because you have continuity, you're taking advantage of the computation you just did to compute the increments. And then once you've done that computation, you then average, so the two effects together give you this higher denoising, higher level of denoising and increased resolution. <clears throat>
And just to make the same point again, if you look right here, this is the true spectrum at around, I think it's around five minutes or so here. It was half so I can see it. And it's at about five minutes, <coughs> excuse me. And the, this is the red line shows the true spectrum of the process at five minutes. The dark black line shows you what the multi-taper spectrum would have computed. And then when you look over here, when you look over here, you actually see the blue line is what the state space multi-taper does. It pretty faithfully tracks what's going on with the true spectrum. And one of the reasons is if you look up here in this diagram, you can see there's a good amount of leakage around this particular frequency here. And you can see all that leakage right here where you don't have that leakage because the computations are done independently. So each comp the computation, each frequency for the state space multi-taper is done separately. So there's much less effective leakage from one, from one band having an effect on another. And here's the, here we are later on in the process where the spectral power is even higher in the, you know, in the true process. And again, you see exactly the same thing. The, there's a good amount of leakage here where the power is actually low. When the power is high, all three, the true, the multi-taper agrees with the state space, multi-taper agrees with the true. But as soon as you start having lower power, you actually have this non-trivial leakage effect that then makes it much more difficult to recover the true, the true spectrum. And so just one final example using this to, to illustrate this. So here we are, this is the time in the operating room. You can see this is about, about 200 minutes or so. And silo fluorine, which we're turning up and down between, oh, approximately one to about 2.5%. Here's the raw EEG. And you can see how it changes with changes in the very, very obvious way with changes in the silo fluorine does. And here's the periodogram. You can see it. It's capturing the spectral changes. You can see the enhanced resolution that you decrease variability you get when you do the multi-taper analysis. Here's the enhanced resolution like we saw before for the state space periodogram. And here's both the enhanced resolution as well as increased denoising and decreased variability that we get from the, the multi-taper, uh, state space multi-taper method. And what's really interesting to see is that you know, this gap which persists here in the middle between the two bands. So here's the low frequency band about 0 0.1 to 4 hertz, and here we are at about 8 to 12 hertz. And this gap seemingly persists, whereas here it gets covered over by the multi-taper and the periodogram, suggesting that some component of this band is likely to be leakage coming from just the fact that you're computing there's power in the spectrum at frequencies, which are not exactly the ones where you're transforming the data. And you know, perhaps what we're calling this additional theta oscillation, some component of it, I'm not saying the whole thing, but some component of it is likely to be just leakage. So it might be the case that all of the theta oscillation that we attribute to Silo fluorine may not necessarily be there. So let's look at one final example quickly. As I said, <clears throat> we can compute a smooth multi-taper spectrogram by summing over this, by computing the posterior distribution by using the state space smoothing algorithm here, which would have this particular form corresponding to the Kalman filter that I showed you a few slides back. And using that, you could also calculate a smooth spectrogram that was based on all the data as opposed to just being based on the data up to the particular point k. And so then you could compute state space, you could state space multi-taper smooth spectrograms as opposed to just the the state space multi-taper what are essentially filtered spectrograms. Again, assuming you knew the variance components. And I'll say a couple words about how we estimated those in just a second. But the key thing about having the, the full spectrogram, or the, the 
the increments, the full distribution of the increments conditional on the data is that it's approximately Gaussian. And so given that, given the ability to compute the filter, the smoother and the covariance smoothing algorithm, you can then compute the full posterior distribution of the ZKs and hence any function of the ZKs that you want. And again, because each of the ZKs is actually independent in the frequency domain, you can do all these calculations independently, then reconstruct your function and, and get it, estimate the uncertainty. And you can do this very easily with, with Monte Carlo. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're going to take some function of the ZKs and we're gonna compute confidence intervals for it. So this is that data that I showed you, of the data that which I showed you in the beginning of the talk. And here's this giving increasing doses of propofol. And now one of the other things that I'm showing you is here how we can recover the time domain signal for the, uh, um, based on the, 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 the state space multi-taper. So this is the multi-taper spectrogram. Now here's the state space multi-taper spectrogram. You can see it's much more, it's been quite, there's much more denoising and higher resolution here relative to the, the states, the multi-taper. And now here are these time periods here that I'm pointing to before, awake, loss of consciousness, where the person lost consciousness, they're profoundly unconscious, and here they recover consciousness over here, and they're wide awake there. So we wanna compare some function at let's say a time point here with some function at a time point here to calculate the difference in the spectral properties. Whereas both of these show the same spectral properties, we understand the probability structure or the estimate, approximate probability structure of these data here. So, whereas you can look at this picture here, you can also look at the, you can look at this picture and you can carry out a formal statistical inference with the, the functions computed from the, the state space multi taper spectrogram. So for, we used J equal to 1000, K equal to 233, five tapers with a spectral resolution of 1.5 Hertz. And so here's the function that I wanted to compute. I wanted to take at, for a hundred second interval around each one of those little locales that I showed you in the spectrogram, I wanted to take a hundred second interval and compute the difference between by, by frequency of the spectrogram at those locations and then compute a confidence interval for that difference. So this average difference in power. All right, so very easy to say, but how do you actually compute that? So we just did it by Monte Carlo because we can draw ZKs and every time we draw a ZK, a set of ZKs, we can compute the spectral estimate. We can do that a large number of times. We take the difference at one location relative to another location and we do that you know, 10,000 times and we can construct a confidence interval. So here it is. So here we are comparing the point of loss of conscience with awake, let's say, unconscious with awake and recovery of conscience with awake across all the frequencies using a 100 second time interval for both of the, <clears throat> for all locations. And you can see one of the things you see is when you lose consciousness, you have a large rise in 10 Hertz power and there's a large rise in 10 hertz power relative when you're, when you're unconscious and when you're awake. And the same thing is true when you're recovering consciousness. And if you can look over here, you can compare the two awake states. So this is awake after the anesthesia with awake before the anesthesia. You can see they look essentially very, very similar. And, and you know, these things are significantly different if zero you know, fails to fall in the confidence interval for the difference. And what's nice about this, because we're doing all these inferences from the, the joint distribution, there's not a multiple hypothesis testing problem. We've calculated the parameters of the model by maximum likelihood using an EM algorithm. And we're carrying out a formal, what is essentially empirical Bayes inference. So in summary, with the state-space time frequency analysis, we can, Use state space filtering to compute real time spectrogram estimates and achieve enhanced spectral resolution and denoising relative to multi taper methods. We can use an EM algorithm to perform parameter estimation with one algorithm per frequency and per taper because, in the frequency domain, these calculations are all independent. We're using the state space, the state space and covariance smoothing methods, we can compute empirical based spectrogram estimates. <clears throat> 
and we can apply the empirical Bayes frameworks I just showed you to do the spectrogram inference. So we can recover time domain signals for any desired frequency. I showed you that a little bit. Those red plots in the um, in the previous those red curves in the previous in the previous uh, graph were basically computations of the um, the time domain signal based on the spectral estimates. So you can get a time domain estimate as well as a spectral domain estimate with this approach, which you can't get with multi-taper methods. So thank you very much for your attention.